Thank you. Um, we just really want to extend our gratitude, first and foremost, to the San Francisco Public Library uh, and, to, and to all the archivists here who we worked with as well. Um, this is actually where our story begins, interestingly enough. And um, we're going we're gonna to take you over the next hour, essentially, through the narrative of how we discovered this document, uh, the many sort of uh, research uh, uh, roads that this project took us down over the course of discovering Alice Smith's memoir, and um, and hopefully you get a pretty well-rounded picture of the, sort of the history of, of this story. Um, and we definitely welcome questions afterwards. Uh, but yeah, as I mentioned, it was, it was a little over four years ago that Devin and I were holed up here behind a microfilm reader at the San Francisco Main Library on the fifth floor. Uh, and we discovered the memoir of Alice Smith, published in 1913 by a newspaper called the San Francisco Bulletin. And her story was titled A Voice from the Underworld. So you can see the opening installment here on the screen. Uh, at the time, we knew very little about this piece. What we did know is that it was one of the first serialized memoirs published by Fremont Older, who was the fascinating editor of the Bulletin, who began his career as a vitriolic crusader, but later became an emphatic advocate for social justice. We knew that Older himself uh, and later biographers connected his publication of A Voice from the Underworld to a later protest which was organized by a group of prostitutes in 1917. And we knew that this was likely the first sex workers' rights protest in modern US history. But what we did not know when we discovered this document and what we could not easily find was anything about who this Alice Smith was. Uh, well, who was this woman? Why was she writing her story? And for that matter, why did the Bulletin publish her memoir? Was her story meant to inspire fear, titillation, pity, perhaps, uh, or maybe compassion? And did Alice Smith even exist? Or was this just some political maneuver orchestrated by the paper to boost sales and engage in the white slavery debate that had taken the nation's media by storm? And that we'll get into a little bit later on in this presentation. What motivated the Bulletin, a leading newspaper in an ever-growing metropolis, to publish near this memoir, first of all, but also nearly 300 letters written by other sex workers and working class women telling their own wide-ranging stories? Over the course of our research, we paid attention to today's newspapers and to the changing face of San Francisco amidst the second coming of the tech industry. We witnessed the shuttering and attempted cleanup of many of the city's centers of vice, you may know the Tenderloin is now being rebranded as Union Square West. <laughs> Obviously, the nude men in the Castro have to cover their bits with decency sheaths. And the pot-smoking runaways on Haight Street are being arrested uh, for sitting on the sidewalks. We watched many of our working class friends get pushed out of the city over the course of working on this project and faced our own eviction troubles. And as San Francisco changed before our eyes, we could not help but recall our research and notice similarities to 1913, when Alice Smith's memoir was published. Uh, the post-earthquake boosterism of real estate after the 1906 earthquake, the cleanup efforts before the 1915 Panama Pacific International Exhibition, the eventual closure of the dance halls, brothels, and gambling dens of the Barbary Coast in 1917 all sounded strikingly familiar. We also noticed a burgeoning discussion about feminism, sex work, and sex workers' rights happening on a global scale today. In 2015, Amnesty International adopted a controversial policy goal of decriminalizing consensual sex work worldwide. This policy spurred a media blitz, and suddenly op-eds written by current and former sex workers were appearing in major papers like the New York Times, the Washington Post, and Guardian UK. We could not help but notice a number of striking similarities to a voice from the underworld. In 1913 and today, politicians, religious groups, anti-trafficking activists, celebrities, and feminists all have had an enormous hand in shaping the way we think about sex work but how many of us have actually heard from sex workers themselves. 
Both in the bulletin in 1913 and today, sex workers are demanding to be heard and to be taken seriously and to be given agency over their own lives. And that's really the key of this whole work. It seems that in 1913, Fremont Older, the editor of the bulletin, genuinely attempted to help the situation by opening the pages of his daily paper as a public forum for equitable debate. And for once, the opinions of prostitutes were published alongside those of prominent politicians and clergymen. What the story we're going to tell you today is sort of about how this story came to be and what Alice's memoir meant for San Francisco, which at the time was really a city in flux. And we hope that each of you are able to quiet your own preconceived notions about sex work for the next hour. And perhaps uh, our, our grand hope is that this presentation will give you some food for thought sort of about the greater spirit of San Francisco, uh, what the sort of cultural soul of this place is whether San Francisco is a sanctuary for social leniency and social justice, or if it's an imperial center of global wealth and power, and how these two different conceptions of San Francisco have swung back and forth over time, and what that actually means for the residents of this city. Uh, so we're going <clears> to <throat> start off the, the, the story of the publication of Alice Smith's memoirs really uh, begins during the gold rush, um, as so much does with the history of San Francisco. Um, and it really begins with two different newspaper editors. A lot of the, our story is told through the newspapers and through San Francisco's fascinating and, and uh, very dramatic history of, uh, of the newspapers. Uh, the first editor, James King of William, he was a vigilante newspaper man who hoped to clean up the shantytown metropolis of San Francisco during the tumultuous 1850s. His paper, the San Francisco Evening Bulletin, was his platform where, according to one historian, he flayed the politicians, the prostitutes, the gamblers, the toughs, the police, and just about everything in sight while championing the home, the church, the school, and reform. Now, Gold Rush San Francisco, due to its geographic isolation, held in its infancy a very relaxed sense of morals, to say the least. Gambling and prostitution were widespread and accepted. In a city where men outnumbered women 50 to 1 with this gender imbalance in 1849, prostitutes ended up serving an interesting and important social function within this male-dominated world. Um, now, throughout, during this time, there's something uh, that in academia call uh, Jacksonian gender roles, but really what this is is uh, from about the 1830s on, um, there's a real clear uh, delineation between the roles of the genders. Uh, women and men sit, were considered to be biologically different, um, psychologically different. Uh, men were supposed to function in the public sphere, and then in the public sphere, they, they controlled the world of economics, politics, but they were also passionate and sexual to a fault and they needed to be curbed and controlled by women. And these would be uh, so-called proper women. These would be women who uh, were asexual by nature. They controlled the domestic sphere, the sphere of morality, religion, the home. Now, these women didn't come out to, to, to early San Francisco um, in the beginning. The women that did come out were, uh, for the most part, prostitutes. And the social codes dictated that men in, a public, in the public sphere as controllers on the public stage, for San Francisco has always been a very public city, um, they needed women to, to, to fulfill this, 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 this role. And for a time, prostitutes and madams were accepted in society because there wasn't an alternative. Um, and, and they... Uh, could acquire a considerable amount of uh, social status and certainly money. Um, they also broke a lot of rules in a way because they were acting in the, econo in the economic sphere, which is the sphere of men. Um, and they also were not championing the home. So when so-called proper women uh, started to come out in, in, in the early 1850s, more and more uh, this imbalance was restored and um, prostitutes were relegated into vice districts, uh, most notably the Barbary Coast, which was got its name in the 1860s from uh, uh, infamous 
North African coastline known for, uh, for um, its piracy. Um, <clears throat> James King of William, the crusading editor who uh, sought to clean up the city, was gunned down in 1856. His death helped spark the infamous Vigilance Committee of 1856, which resulted in public lynchings and open insurrection in the name of law and order. Vice and civic corruption would go hand in glove in the minds of future reformers and vigilantes, including Fremont Older, who took over the reins of the Bulletin in uh, 1895. He started out as a uh, vigilante and a real law and order uh, newspaperman. Um, though he would, in time, become uh, one of one of the great uh, fighters for the those without a voice, um, he he became quite radical, as we'll see. Um, <clears throat> but he originally wanted to use the Bolton as a tool of vigilantism. He wanted to follow what James King of William was doing. He wanted to go after corruption, corruption and vice, as he believed, went hand in glove, and you had to clean up vice in the city if you wanted to clean up civic corruption. Um, he attacked this with a certain religious fervor, and the person who he really went after is a man by the name of Abraham Roof. Uh, this is a famous the graph trials of the first decade of the, of the uh, 20th century. Um, the publication of Alice Smith's memoirs actually really goes right back to Abraham Roof. We can't go too much into this whole story, which is a fascinating one, but uh, the corrupt political boss and the overzealous editor clashed throughout this decade, and Fremont Older very much wanted to put Abraham Roof in prison. He was a political boss. He pulled the strings of the mayor at the time, uh, Mayor Schmitz. Um, but the editor, by 1910, started to have serious doubts about this crusade trying to go after Abe Roof, and uh, he felt that if he, say, cut the head off of this, of, 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 uh, that the body would wither, that this man was responsible for the corruption, and he didn't realize, or he started to realize that there was a lot of corruption, a lot of corruption in a lot of places. Getting rid of this one guy wasn't gonna do it. So he started going after other people, um, including some of the business elite in the city, and this didn't go over very well with, <laughs> with the business elite. Um, in the end, Abraham Roof was sent to San Quentin. And Fremont Older started really being disturbed by this crusade of his. So he went over across the bay to San Quentin and uh, was shocked by the inhumane conditions. He was truly, truly shocked. The next day, he's on the paper, he says, mercy for Abraham Roof. He wants Roof out of prison, who he just spent nine years putting in prison. <laughs> people thought he was insane. A lot of people really thought he was insane. Teddy Roosevelt. Still do. Yeah, Teddy Roosevelt was uh, a big player in this and, uh, and a friend in ways, or they knew each other at least, uh, Fremont Older's. Teddy Roosevelt wasn't happy with this at all. Fremont Older knew people were confused, and so he wanted to uh, get his point out. And I want to read you just a little bit of a speech that he gave uh, explaining why. And this, this really comes all the way back to why he published this memoir of Alice Smith. I have asked for mercy for Roof because I felt that I, above all others, had done most to bring about his downfall. At last, after eight years of a man-hunting and man-hating debauch, Roof crossed over and became what I wanted him to be, a convict, stripped of his citizenship, stripped of everything society values except the remnant of an ill-gotten fortune. It is then I said to myself, I have got him. He is in stripes. He is in a cell. His head is shaved. He is in tears. He is helpless, beaten, chained, killed as far as his old life is concerned. You have won. How do you like your victory? My soul revolted. I saw myself also stripped, that is stripped of all pretense, sham, self-righteousness, holding the key to another man's cell. I dropped the key. I never want to hold it again. Let it be taken up and held by those who feel they are justified in holding it. I want no more jail keys. And this really began a, uh, an episode, uh, it was a, a profound shift in Fremont Older's life where he decided instead of becoming a vigilante newspaperman that was trying to destroy corruption, instead it's like a prosecutor, if you can think about it, like something of like a prosecutor to becoming something of a public defender. And he decided to give a voice 
and to try to protect people that, that didn't have a voice in society. Um, and this was a, a huge shift. That same year, uh, he, while he was visiting Roof in prison, he met a man named Donald Lowry. Now, Freeman Older gave Abraham Roof a platform and asked him, would you write your memoirs to be serialized in the bulletin to explain your position? This is the best way that I can defend you, is to let your words get out. And he did. Um, it was called uh, The Road I Traveled. Um, it was uh, pr pr pretty successful, though people were still pretty weirded out by, by Older defending this man that he essentially, you know, was one of the people that put him in prison. Uh, but he had considerable more success with this next memoir, serialized memoir that he decided to publish, which was uh, a memoir by a man named Donald Lowry. Donald Lowry was a prisoner who uh, was trying to smuggle out his uh, memoir of life in San Quentin, including um, the tortures that were, that were being perpetrated at the prison. Um, he would uh, face a huge, huge, uh, he, he probably wouldn't have ever gotten out of prison had those memoirs been smuggled out, but caught, had he been caught. Uh, so he was very scared about this because he was going to get out in a few years. Freeman Older was fascinated by him. Freeman Older still had quite a lot of political power, and he actually had him, he had him uh, paroled under his wing, gave him a job on the newspaper, and asked if he could publish those memoirs in his paper. Uh, my Life in Prison became an important book, and it did, that book, the publication of it, ended torture in both Sing Sing in New York and um, San Quentin and Folsom Prison in California. And uh, prison, historians of prison and prison reform have pointed to Donald Lowry's book as one of the, the foundational works of uh, the prison reform movement. Fremont Older was part of this. He uh, also was wanted to continue this, uh, this project. And um, when the red light abatement law, which we're going to talk about in a, in a moment, uh, came up, uh, the idea of publishing the, the memoir of a prostitute became very important. And uh, Alice Smith and Fremont Older met. Yeah, so uh, by the time Fremont Older prepared to publish Alice Smith's story, women had entered a new era of political engagement in San Francisco and nationwide, really. Uh, in 1911, California voters approved a suffrage bill uh, which is nine years before the 19th Amendment made it legal for women to vote nationwide. And the enfranchisement of women indicates, obviously, a major shift in how gender roles were defined. As we mentioned, you know, for many decades, there had been these sort of solidified ideals of women as the defenders of the home, these sort of asexual, moral uh, rulers of the private sphere, men as being naturally violent and sexual and uh, social and therefore prepared to engage in the sort of muddied world of politics and finance, which were considered far too sordid for uh, gentle feminine sensibilities as they were seen at the time. Um, but the second you have suffrage pass and women engaging in the public sphere politically, these notions sort of start to crumble humble, of course. Um, now, it's not a coincidence that these suffrage movements coincided with these sort of uh, these, these national scandals of civic corruption, like these graft trials with Abe Roof that Devin was talking about, um, but also corruption scandals at, in Tammany Hall in New York City. Uh, the, these scandals really connected in the minds of Americans concepts of uh, political deviancy being connected to vice, crime, and criminality. And there was a strong desire to sort of clean up politics nationwide. And there was a sense that women, who now were politically enfranchised and who were was still considered to be by nature moral, uh, had the natural capacity to reform the, the sordid world of American politics. Um, and rather than outright rejecting these gendered notions that had forced them to remain within the private sphere of the home for so long, many women argued that, yes, they could bring morality and righteousness to this depraved world of politics. Uh, and, and so while implicitly agreeing with gendered notions that were still rooted in misogyny, suffragettes were able to win the vote and thus enter the public sphere in a legitimized way. 
Uh, And immediately upon enfranchisement, California's largest women's clubs began campaigning to pass a number of statewide reforms. Uh, The California Federation of Women's Clubs, which was the largest largest group of organized women, quickly agreed upon a legislative platform that included new testing standards for dairy products, the creation of maternity homes, um, joint guardianship over children. Uh, But the main law that really galvanized this new women's movement was called the Red Light abatement and an injunction act and the goal of the red light abatement act was to close the state's brothels by attacking those that profited off prostitution namely the property owners of houses of ill fame or brothels Um, and though prostitution was already technically illegal in most places across the state through various you know city or countywide uh laws that had been passed um it still existed often in these sort of, you know, segregated districts that police and politicians would turn a blind eye to. Uh, These segregated districts were sort of considered a necessary evil uh, for society, a place where men's lusts could be siphoned into and away from so-called decent women. Um, And and actually there's an interesting... uh, there's an interesting anecdote analysis story where she she arrives in a new small mining town here in California and wants to find the red light district and asks a local police officer who doesn't hesitate to point her in the right direction. Uh, so club women were horrified by the civic corruption that they believed allowed prostitution to flourish and the Red Light Abatement Act was designed to circumvent this corrupt police power by empowering citizens to directly file public nuis- nuisance complaints against suspected houses of prostitution. And it's true that these club women were not entirely incorrect. It had been recently exposed that San Francisco's Union Labor Party mayor, Eugene Schmitz, and Abraham Roof, the political boss of Fremont Older's ire, had been bankrolling half of the profits from a notorious uh, Barbary Coast brothel at, on Jackson near Kearney Street, which was then uh, popularly nicknamed the Municipal Brothel. But did that necessarily mean that these women could destroy the institution of prostitution by closing the brothels down? And what would become of the state's prostitutes and dance hall workers? Many of the state's legislators argued that this law would simply scatter prostitution throughout the state and out of the confines of these segregated districts. Uh, The women's clubs responded by beginning a fund to create settlement homes for these newly unemployed and evicted sex workers. But as the women of the San Francisco Center of the California Civic League, which is the earliest iteration of the League of Women Voters, um, soon discovered, few, if any, of these sex workers actually agreed to move into these homes. And you can see if you go to the, um, well, the California Historical Society has a box of the League of Women Voters papers that we've been looking through where they have these meeting minutes and they interviewed um, hundreds of these Barbary Coast women and asked them, would you move into our settlement homes? You know, Would you reform if we closed down the brothels and the dance halls? And really the resounding answer is no, the vast, vast majority. Um, Many of these club women based their assumptions about prostitution on these white slavery narratives that had, for the previous decades, taken the nation's media by storm. Uh, These narratives distilled racism and national anxiety around modernization and immigration and portrayed sex workers as victims enslaved by depraved pimps and entrapped in a sordid and inescapable underworld that was often run by people of color. And while many of these stories which were published in nearly all of the nation's newspapers. Um, There were a ton of plays. Even Eugene O'Neill wrote one of these white slavery narratives as one of his first sort of big off-Broadway productions. Um, They were passed out in pamphlets, often by suffragettes in in coalition with their uh, their vote, get get out the vote paperwork. And many of these stories were claimed to be penned by real sex workers, but the vast majority have been debunked as just entirely propagandized. Uh, Let's see. But it was these stories that really inspired the California club women to see themselves as 
the saviors of these victims who were in their minds really in need of saving. Um, and due to concerted pressure placed on the state, legislat state legislatures by the women's clubs, the Red Light Abatement Act was signed and passed into law in 1913. It was quickly contested and sort of went back and forth. Um, there was a long referendum battle, but that's the real sort of uh, world into which Alice Smith emerges and, and one of the main reasons why Fremont Older felt it was important to put these women's stories at the forefront of a discussion that would obviously greatly impact their lives, but from which they had been almost entirely ignored. So Al Smith's story, uh, it follows her from her humble Midwestern upbringing to the shores of the Pacific, where she works at different times before she turns to prostitution um, as a telephone operator, a domestic servant, a laundry worker, and an itinerant farm worker, uh, before turning to freelance prostitution, which eventually leads her to work at various brothels, and then as a short stint as a madam. Um, Alice's story deals with many controversial topics such as abortion, police corruption, and the sphere of female interdependence within the brothel system. A voice from the underground ran six days a week over the summer of 1913, causing an unprecedented response from the Bolton's readers. According to the Bulletin, nearly 4,000 letters flooded into the offices and nearly 300 were published alongside Alice's story. 114 of these letters were penned by other self-proclaimed sex workers and many by single working class women, making the Bulletin the primary mouthpiece for sex workers and one could argue perhaps uh, for uh, working class single women as well during the red light abatement controversy in San Francisco. The Bulletin, unlike rivals such as the pro Red Light Abatement Act examiner, that's one of you know, uh, Hearst's papers, of course, the examiner, refused to fixate upon this so-called white slavery frenzy. By early 1913, the paper had announced the upcoming memoir, and this is what the paper had to say, the Bulletin. Al Smith's story and the remarkable letters from women of the underworld which have been printed with it will accomplish several things. One end has been attained already. No open-minded reader of the story and the letters will ever look upon prostitutes as he or she once did, as much victims of our social system as the children who work in southern cotton mills, or the exploited who give up their lives in the bowels of a skyscraper's foundations. In a separate editorial, the paper directly criticized the methodology behind a, a top-down cure-all legislation that really failed to adequately address the core issues at hand, as, it as the, the bulletin wrote in this other editorial. Our legislators did not consult the women of the underworld. The women themselves must speak. They must tell their side freely and fully, and their words must be weighed and studied. Otherwise, our best efforts are but experiments. The state legislator had struck at one form of vice, wholly ignorant as to whether the alternative is a worse form of vice. It would build a refuge for women. This is uh, one of these settlement homes, this idea of, 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 of uh, building homes for, for, for women, to, you know, as Ivy said, um, as shelters, without knowing in the least whether women will flee to that refuge. The legislature is in the position of a doctor who gives his patient a pill without asking a question of the sufferer. The pill might do nothing, or it might cure, or it might kill, or it might stop one sickness and start another. The sensible doctor would first learn the patient's symptoms first, at first hand. Um, in keeping with what would become a tradition at the Bulletin of memoirs being ghostwritten from interviews by newspaper staff, we uncovered evidence that Donald Lowry, who wrote My Life in Prison, as I was just talking about, um, was one of these people who interviewed Alice. Alice did not write her own words. It was ghostwritten by a, a senior reporter named Ernest Hopkins. Um, we discovered that Donald Lowry, that we hadn't found any evidence of Donald Lowry actually having any part in this, but we really thought he did. Um, and he was one of the people that interviewed um, Alice. Now, we had a lot of concerns and there was a lot of questions. This era of yellow journalism, sensationalist papers, uh, the Boltons competing with the the great yellow, the, the, the Ur Yellow Journal, the San Francisco Examiner under Hearst. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons to suggest that perhaps the, the Bolton made this all up. Perhaps it was purely ghostwritten, that they wanted to sell papers, they wanted to get in on this. We weren't sure. We really felt 
that by, by looking at it not as a traditional white slavery narrative, of which it wasn't, but for the most part, you can't find actual memoirs uh, during this period that are remotely trustworthy, and many academics had uh, pointed that out to us. So people were a little skeptical. Um, uh, in our introduction, we tried to address this, but uh, remarkably, two days after the book came out, we actually discovered uh, Alice Smith's real name, and she was a person. Um, I'll tell you very quickly about what happened. Ernest Hopkins, who was the ghostwriter, in 1930 had turned to writing pulp, pulp novels or pulp fiction for a pulp paper and was struggling to make enough money to support his family. And this is the first year of the Depression. And he said, hey, remember, he wrote to Fremont Older and said, remember that, that story, um, A Voice from the Underworld? Remember that we always wanted to make it into a book, but we felt like it would be politically maybe dangerous to actually publish at the time. And uh, he said, I think now we could do it in 1930. And uh, really, he was basically saying, I think we could make some money off of this. But one of the issues was, he, you know, now, now keep in mind, he's the sole writer of this piece. He was the only ghostwriter. He wrote it. But he's having to ask Freeman Older for permission to publish it because he said, remember, we must uh, contact Mabel because it is Mabel's story and we need to... I, I, it was so important to you that any money that we made off of the publication of A Voice from the Underworld, that a, a significant percentage of those funds had to go towards Mabel. Um, and he asked, do you know where Mabel is? We actually know her last name. We're deciding not because we're, the question of anonymity is so important. The Bulletin kept her identity protected for so long and we only stumbled across it in the archives at Cal Berkeley that um, we are figuring out what we're gonna do with it, but we wanna keep the spirit of that and not uh, mention her last name until we publish further up, uh, on it. Um, and so, yes. Just that, and, that, and that's really, if you read the introduction to our book, so much of what it deals with is this question of who is she, did she really exist, and you know, if this story is a composite of many different women's stories, or if it's totally fabricated, is it still relevant? And and we really argue and and make what I hope is a strong case that it's still relevant um, as far as just revealing different attitudes about sex work and feminism and working class women and marriage, et cetera, at that time. Um, but it really, you know, and, and one of the main core things that we deal with in our introduction is this question of anonymity and how critical it is um, within sex workers' narratives even today often are written anonymously uh, and, and it's because there, there is such an intensive stigma here in our society that pseudonyms are, are used uh, not only by sex workers as sort of a performative choice but as a way of protecting their identities for very valid and critical reasons. And so... Um, we really felt that, you know, t by by calling her Alice Smith and by apparently taking all these pains to protect who she was, um, which made it challenging as researchers because we couldn't just say, oh yes, we know exactly who this woman is, we can trace who she is, when she was born, when she died, et cetera, et cetera. We instead had to deal with her as sort of a mystery um, and and invest a lot of faith in the San Francisco Bulletin, which, which we did not take lightly in any way. Um, but that anonymity really is the the sort of critical linchpin of it, and that's why, like we said, we're we're still continuing to maintain privacy around her name, which you can find if you want to go to the Ber ba Berkeley Bancroft archives. Yes, we're, we're not hiding it. Um, if if you would like to go to that archives, it's easy enough to actually find uh, if you know where to look. They're in the Fremont Older Papers with his correspondence with Ernest Hopkins in 1930. Uh, two quick points about that, and then we actually have to wrap this up pretty soon. Um, Two quick points is that uh, an incredible thing that Ernest Hopkins asked is he said, you know what, when we publish this, we can return the original ending. He says that, remember, we had to change the ending about how she got out of prostitution. Remember, for political reasons, we couldn't tell the real story. Well, if we republish this um, in a book form, we can actually tell the actual story. Unfortunately, they never did. Well, I guess fortunately for us, they never did because we got to publish it. Unfortunately, we don't know what that story is. So, um, but that also I, suggests to us that her, mem her memoir must have been really quite um, 
pretty accurately uh, portrayed if they're just talking about the need to change the ending because the ending was something that was maybe politically uh, a bit of a hot potato. Um, the other thing uh, which was interesting is Fremont Older wrote back to him and said, I, I saw Mabel within the last year, which means that as of 1930, Mabel still lived in San Francisco um, and it was no longer a prostitute, or that's at least what it would seem. Um, Just a few more minutes, you want to wrap it up, talk about the sex worker room? Sure, do you want to read, let's read a couple, let's read a couple okay. excerpts, sure. um, if you want to read, we'll just read a couple excerpts, um, both from Alice's story and from some of these letters, so you can get a taste of sort of the diversity of these narratives, but that was really the thing that clued us into the fact that this was a really important document when we discovered it. Um, not only was Alice's story gripping, but as we mentioned, uh, at least 300 other letters were written into the paper and published alongside specifically by other self-proclaimed sex workers and working class women. Um, and, and then of course, you know, dozens of other letters written by the mayor of Berkeley wrote in and, and weighed in on his opinions. Many club women wrote in and gave their opinions on all sorts of topics from marriage to abortion to uh, capitalism, et cetera. It, the list goes on and on. And the voices are so wide ranging in their opinions and their political backgrounds and their sort of class backgrounds. And that's really what was uh, the most fascinating aspect of this document to us. Um, yeah, we'll read one, uh, one excerpt from Alice's memoir. Um, one of the main points that comes up over and over uh, throughout the literature, throughout reading uh, primary sources from the time, the newspapers, um, but it was that the typical wage for a working class woman was six dollars a week, which was, historians have claimed to be st literally starvation wages. Um, and that would, the, the expectation is that women who are s single, there's something wrong with them. You're supposed to get married, and, you know? And so if you're a single working class woman, it's like, eh, you know, yeah, okay, you have your six dollars a week, but you're gonna have to supplement that with a man in some way, whether it's a family or whether it's a husband. Uh, this is what Alice does uh, when she starts working out before she becomes a prostitute, how she's gonna live on $6 a week. I went back to my new $2 room, turned on the light, sat down on the hard bed, and figured things out. I had a sort of feeling as if I was hanging by a thin rope over a volcano. $6 a week, take out two for room rent. That left four a week for eating, clothes, car fare, washing, and a good time. Cut out car fare, cut out clothes for the present. My old shoes would have to do. Cut out washing. I'd do it myself in my room. Cut out, yes, cut out the good times. I'd need that $4 just for eating. Divide it by seven, that meant 60 cents a day. 10 cents for breakfast, 20 for lunch, 30 for supper. That would make 24, a, that'd make 420 a week. I'd be 20 cents short. Well, maybe Sundays I'd go without eating, only 20 cents worth. And uh, the, those questions about class really are the sort of defining, uh, I, th I think that's the real linchpin of Alice, linchpin of Alice Smith's story. Um, and, and many of these sex workers who wrote into the paper were really complaining about this disconnect disconnect, excuse me, between reformers who tended to come from upper class, educated, white, Christian families, um, and, and, and they, they felt they were being pigeonholed as victims when in reality they were coming from an incredibly diverse background. You know, many of these sex workers obviously weren't white, and many were facing extreme poverty, but some were not as well. And, uh, and just to give you sort of a taste of some of these voices um, and how sort of controversial and, and, and contemporary they seem nowadays. Uh, Alma Green, who she wrote a series of like seven or eight letters into the newspaper that were really eloquent and lengthy. Uh, she was a 21-year-old sex worker raising two kids in one of the kind of high-class brothels here in San Francisco. Um, and we've included one of her letters here in this volume. Uh, she admitted that she preferred the self-made life of an escort to that of a society woman's charity case. Uh, and, and Georgia G., another sex worker, wrote, 
As for building a home for us, they will never fill it because there is not a woman among us that will accept it unless we are forced to. We feel that if we do so, there will always be somebody to point the finger of scorn at us, no matter how good we tried to be. Uh, and one of these women, Cecil Linden, talks about how uh, she, you know, she, she was actually a dance hall girl. She wasn't a prostitute. She was a dancer in one of these dance clubs on the Barbary Coast. And these reform women were essentially uh, treating her the same way that they would a prostitute and were trying to create laws simultaneously as they were closing down the brothels that would also um, prevent women from working in establishments that served liquor, for instance, which meant that any girl who was a waitress or uh, a bartender or anything like that would be out of a job, obviously, or a dancer in one of these clubs. Um, and Cecil Linden says, when I was 15 years old, I was thrown out on the world to make my own way. Raised of a good and loving mother and not knowing the ways of the world, I entered the nightlife. And now I myself would work as a, in a proper job and be glad to get it, but I can't get work to do. And she shows up at one of these sort of reform houses uh, and asks the associated charities to get her a job and they ask her for references. Uh, and so she, she expresses a lot of anger and frustration around that. I know. Um, so, anyhow. Uh, I was just gonna, so what, if any of you are interested uh, in purchasing the book, uh, just we have a 70-page, quite a long um, introduction where we go into considerably more depth than we have tonight about uh, questions. We have Alice's memoir, and then we also have 12 different letters by sex workers uh, interspersed throughout it uh, to give a little bit of a sense of what it was like to maybe read read it as a day, as a serial in the paper. Um, we have also been working to publish a number of the letters that we weren't able to include because there are so many, and this book obviously would have been enormous if we included all of them that we loved uh, on our website. And so we can give you a card for our website, which uh, has a blog that we've been pretty regularly updating with some of the unpublished letters as well. And then we also have an email list of uh, we'll be doing um, uh, several events, a bunch of events next year, um, including, uh, well, anyway. You, the, you can, you can the, have a look at the the final thing that we'll tell you before opening it up for questions. Um, I just want to mention the sex workers march really quickly. Um, so after the publication of Alice Smith's story, the Red Light Abatement Act it, it passed its final hurdles statewide. It took a number of years, but by 1917, the city's police force was finally directed to shut down the Barbary Coast and to evict all of the brothel workers, which it was 1,400 women who were all kicked out onto the streets on Valentine's Day, 1917, which, uh, happy Valentine's Day. Uh, but before that, um, they, they were given a warning by the police department that they would be evicted. And so a number of these women decided that they were going to organize a protest, which if you read current histories of sex worker rights organizing, uh, the real beginning tends to go back to like say the 1960s, 1970s here in San Francisco. And this March in 1917 is really a forgotten piece of history. And the reason why it's connected to Alice's story is because these madams who decided to organize the march needed to get the word out quickly and they approached their friend Fremont Older, the editor of the San Francisco Bulletin, who had developed such intimate connections with a number of women of the underworld that they knew that if he sent out a messenger, he could get the word out throughout the Barbary Coast within a night. And so these two madams, Reggie Gamble and Maud Spencer, uh, went to the Bulletin offices. They worked with Fremont Older to write a speech to send out letters to all these women. And the next morning, uh, at least 300 of them showed up on the steps of this church where the Reverend had been one of the primary campaigners uh, for the clo closure of the Barbary Coast, essentially. And they showed up on his door, they, they showed up on the doorstep, they flooded the church pews, and uh, Reggie Gamble marched up to the pulpit and gave a whole speech about, you know, you want us gone, but where do you want us to go? Are you going to offer us work, you know, living wages that we can live off of if we're not prostitutes? And we don't mean this six dollars a week that you that you guys keep offering that they're paying us. We mean an actual living wage. And the Reverend Paul Smith kind of balked and had nothing to say back to them. Now, of course, you know, as I said, this, you know, it, it's it's a protest. It didn't mean that 
a month later, they weren't all evicted. Um, but it connects this greater history of, of sex workers' rights organizing and social justice organizing here in San Francisco that we, we believe began, or that most pe historians believe began in the 70s and the 60s, all the way back here to 1917. And uh, our, our next scheduled event actually is with the Tenderloin Museum on January 25th, which is the 100 year anniversary of this protest. We're gonna be working with some contemporary sex worker rights activists to uh, stage another march to the site of the of the classic church. So if you're interested in that event, um, do sign up on our email list and, and we'll we'll keep you in the know. Um, is there any yeah, I any, turn over to any questions. questions? Yeah. 